have us to hear. Let us not worry whether our neighbor's listening. Let us just hear in our own spirit, man, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. How many of you enjoyed Pastor Murray Ray last week? Wasn't that a blessing? Wow. Wow. Good, good, good people. Very good people. So a couple of weeks ago I said this. To be in Christ makes us fit for heaven, but for Christ to be in us makes us fit for earth. However, I didn't add this part. Victorious Christian living depends on more than keeping the law, or shall we say, working a formula. It's not a formula. God's looking for a relationship, right? So in Galatians 2.19, New Living, Paul said this, For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, four times in the Bible it says that the just shall live by faith. Paul saying, this is how I live victoriously, by faith in Christ who's in me. And what he's talking about is what's called an exchanged life. An exchanged life. And Jesus made the great exchange when he took our place on the cross and died for our sins and for our sicknesses. Can you say amen? amen. He took our place. Now Colossians 1.25 said, God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming this entire message to you. Remember years ago I preached in a church that I kind of more or less, Deb and I kind of grew up in. And uh, I got the at the end of a sermon, sermon and I said, now does anybody have any questions? And nobody had any questions. And on the way out the door my pastor pulled me in the office. He goes, I'm going to tell you something right now. Don't ever do that again. I said, do what again? Don't ever ask people if they have any questions. I said, well, why not? He goes, what if you don't have the answer? I said, well, then I'll come see you or I'll find out somewhere. I'll get the answer and I'll tell them the answer. This is what Paul said. He, said, he basically says, I have not withheld to give you the entire counsel of the Word of God. Well, you know, you've got to stay a step ahead. You've got to know what all the other people don't know. Well, duh, that ain't going to work for me. So he said in verse 26, This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. Tell your neighbor, Christ lives in you. Think of this just for one minute. Out of all the places that Jesus could live, he chose to live in you. Think of this. Wherever our feet take us, we're taking Jesus with us. That's why, that, that's why Solomon says, ponder the path of your feet. Think about, you know what, wherever you find your feet, guess what? That's where you're going to be. Is that not brilliant? Wherever your feet are, that's where you're going to be. Now, nah, no, I'm getting into some deep stuff here now. God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too, and this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing His glory. So we're not only living for heaven someday, but we're living in the now, permeated with Christ Himself in us, which produces in us a living faith. You remember what James said in, in chapter 2 about a living faith. Verse 26, For as the body without the spirit, that spirit word there means breath, a body without breath, what's he saying? It's dead. So faith without works is dead also. We, have, we do works because we're born again, not to be born again. We're born again when we believe in the Lord Jesus and confess him. We're doing works as corresponding actions because we are in Christ. We will have corresponding actions that follow. So I want to talk about that today. In other words... A living body breathes and produces actions, and so does a living faith breathe with corresponding actions of good works. So besides salvation, a living faith provides several things. I'm going to list three of them. Number one, are becoming obedient to His Word and the leading of His Spirit. A living faith. A living faith. Number two, are learning to trust the adequacy of Christ in us to release divine actions through us. 
And number three, a living faith reveals our total dependence on God as opposite of the independent spirit that we saw in Adam. So Peter wrote in Acts 17, 28, for in him, everybody say in him, in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your other poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. I want to bring forth much fruit in my life, don't you? For without me you can do nothing. So he's saying without him we have no life. But with him, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Can you say amen? So I've mentioned many times, those of you that's been with me for any length of time, I love typologies in the Bible. How many of you love typologies? You know, I'm not talking about typos. It's a story that relates to another story. I know there's a word for it, metaphor or similitude. Simil simil help me, Alan. Similitude, similar, whatever. I like typologies. And I want to talk about three of them today. Exodus 15:22. Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea, and they moved out into the desert of Shur. Now Shur was a, was a caravan route east of the Red Sea, and some scholars believe the name of it means wall, which comes from a series of walls that the Egyptians built as a defense against their invaders. I don't know why I told you that. I just thought it would really make your day. It says there, they traveled in this desert for three days without finding any water. You know, they say you can go how many days without food? You can't, you usually can't go over three days without water. They traveled three days without finding any water. When they came to the oasis of Mara, I had to laugh because it wasn't an oasis. It's kind of deceptive. The water was too bitter to drink. So they called the place Mara, which means bitter. Then the people complained and turned against Moses. Go figure. What are, you going, what are we going to drink, they demanded. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Now the King James says the Lord showed him a tree. Moses threw it into the water, and this made the water good to drink. It was there at Marah that the Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness to him. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands and keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord your doctor. Obviously, this whole story is speaking about a type of redemption. It presents a picture of a redeemed believer who has been delivered from the world, reconciled to God through faith in Christ, but immediately runs into problems. Remember the parable of the sower in Mark 4. It says that, that when problems and trials come because of the word, immediately these people are offended. When the word is sown, immediately Satan comes to steal that word from our heart. So here we see, a redeemed believer has been delivered, reconciled to God by faith in Christ, immediately running into problems. But listen, God always makes a way of escape. Amen? God always makes a way of escape. So let me expand this with just a couple verses that might seem to be out of order. But this is, to me, it's really interesting. Isaiah 45, 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he has established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. This is interesting. He created it not in vain, which the Greek word for vain is to who? He created it not to who? To lie waste, a desert, confusion, and an empty place. Let's go on. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I want you to, I want you to concentrate on this just for a minute. This sounds like there's a conflict between Moses and Isaiah. I want to cover this slowly. Isaiah said the earth was not 
created void and dark. Moses said the earth was void and dark. What's the key word? It's right here. Was, a three-letter word. Haya. To cause, to happen, to become, to come to pass. The earth was not created void and dark, but became so. And I'm not here to discuss why or how, if it was when Satan was kicked out of heaven. I don't know what it was. Don't want to talk about that. But in the darkness, the key scripture here is, it says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters to bring life. Now, if you want to, you can hinge every now and then. Let me know that you're listening, right? What is the type that we see here? It's just as an unsaved man's waters are deep and bitter in him, like Mara. But the Holy Spirit is constantly moving and stirring to bring him to life. Amen. Is that okay? I, I just pray this word will just give you sweet water today. Sweet water. So we see a similar story with Adam that he was created and God breathed his life into him and commanded him, do not eat of the knowledge of of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we know that Satan came along and deceived them and told them, well, if you do eat of this tree, you will become as wise as God and you'll become God. So let's tie this together. Adam, through his disobedience, through his disobedience, virtually filled his soul with bitter waters. He stepped out of life into death out of dependence into independence, he lost his relationship with God, which has affected mankind ever since. Thank you, Adam. The Bible says in Romans 3.23. What does the Bible say in Romans 3.23? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's all. That's all. All. Everybody. What does all mean? It means all. What's the deep meaning of all? All. Romans 5.12 says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. King David even said this in Psalm 51.5, for I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. So when people are not born again and they act like sinners, it's because they are. Sinners sin. It's not complicated. We don't need to tell a sinner that he's a sinner. He knows. We just need to live the life that would encourage him and say, you know what? You're living a whole lot better life than I am. I need to make a change. So you and I have the opportunity, just as Moses and his followers had, we have the opportunity to choose the tree that will allow us to step out of death into life, out of independence into dependence, and enjoy the benefits and the provision of God. We have that choice. In fact, Deuteronomy 30, 19, uh, Moses wrote this, and God said it, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. This day is going on record. God's recording this day, everything that takes place today. I believe God even enjoyed that Beatles song that we did. Man, that was good, Chuck. You killed it, man. I did. Come together. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose. Therefore, choose life. Why? Would someone not want life? I mean, that's, that's like a question that, that John Boy would answer. If I said, why would somebody not like, want life? He'd say, because they're a moron. <laughs> right, John Boy? <laughs> Amen. God said, I am presenting. Whew, I'm presenting to you right now the opportunity to receive eternal life, to get out of your own self, get out of your own independence, and you can depend on me because you can count on me. 
I'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I never had a, a physical brother, but I had a sister and she gave me fits. No, I'm kidding. I'm hoping she'll watch this video. I'm setting before you life. I'm setting before you blessing. I'm giving you the opportunity. What do you got to do? Accept it. Yeah, but what I got to do? Accept it. But yeah, but what do I got to do to get it? Accept it. Are you deep? See, the very beginning of our salvation is found by recognizing Jesus' death on a tree and his resurrection, which followed. Death couldn't hold him. I think the devil was glad to get rid of him. I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. Why? Because he is the tree for treating our bitterness. By faith in his accomplished works, we are reconciled to God. That means change mutually. It means we now have the same feelings one towards the other. Can you say amen? amen. I'm going to look at the second typology. I really like this one. It's found in 2 Kings 2. It begins in a beautiful city and that was just so awesome. It was fantastic. It had everything your heart could want. Everyone would love to live there or at least spend a long vacation there. And to the naked eye, it was incredible. A lot of things we see that's incredible to the naked eye. Visitors would tell the residences there, you are so blessed to live here. I tell my sister that every time I talk to her on the phone. You're so blessed to live right outside Daytona, Florida, till the hurricanes come. You're so blessed. You're so blessed to live in this beautiful place. And the residences would just smile and shake their head. And even though it appeared to be beautiful and perfect, the next few verses will give us a peek of the truth. 2 Kings 2.19. One day the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha, the prophet. We have a problem, my lord, they told him. This town is located in pleasant surroundings, as you can see. But the water is bad, and the land is unproductive. The King James says the ground is barren. It's interesting when visitors would compliment the residences there about the beauty of the city and how blessed they were to live there, that it would trouble them in their spirit because they knew the inner secret regarding their city. In verse 19, the King James says, The water is not, and the ground is barren. So check this out. Not does not mean there is none or non-existent. Not means it's stale and stagnant. Anybody ever drink any stale, stagnant water? Remember years ago, my dad and I were running this roof job. It was so hot. It would scald the feet off of a cat. No, that's hot. We went down to take a break. We forgot to take our iced tea for the day. There's a garden hose hanging on the wall. Turn that water on. Dad took several great big gulps of that water. I took like one sip, and it's like, it's sickening. Later on, he said, hey, I got to sit down. What's going on? He goes, everything's green. Everything he looked at was green. You know why? Because the water was stale and stagnant. So, he says here, barren does not mean that nothing grew. Otherwise, why would all these people be complimenting the residences that lived there? It was plush. It was beautiful. Barren literally means to cause to miscarry. Let's tie this in. Let's get this type out of here. Imagine the sadness of the people that live there in springtime knowing that the water was stagnant and the land always miscarried. Think of this. The trees were budding, the leaves were growing, blossoms were flourishing. They knew that the stale water and the barren land would cause the fruit to fall prematurely to the ground and rot. So what is the type that he's speaking of? He's speaking of a carnal Christian who has been delivered from bondage, confronted with bitter waters or problems, but they refuse to change. You know, this is why Paul says that we must renew our mind with the Word of God. 
No longer be conformed to the world and the things of this world, but be transformed by renewing our mind with God's Word. This speaks of someone who prayed the prayer but remains camped out at the foot of the cross. You remember Hebrews 6 where it says, let us go on to maturity. Let us grow. I've said before, if I have to part your mustache to give you the bottle, we got a problem. Time to grow. See, so many times we think of a carnal Christian as, oh, like a backslider or, or, slider or a wounded warrior or someone that's cheating on their spouse or, or lying on their taxes or stealing from their employer. But the truth is, a carnal Christian can be a Sunday school teacher, can be a pastor, can be a missionary, can be an evangelist. There's no way to look at someone and know their own heart. Paul tells us that no man knows the heart of another man. On the outside, if they're beautiful, they look perfect, they're flawless, they must walk on water. A carnal Christian is one that knows how to talk the talk. You know what I'm saying? They've got down the Christianese language. They're totally sincere in every word they, they say. They mean what they say. They're sweet people. They have a nice smile like those in the beautiful city of Jericho. They'll offer words of encouragement. They'll receive kind words as well. But as we read in 2 Kings, in their heart, they know that their fruit will fall prematurely and the ground, to the ground and rot and never produce. In their heart, they know this. They're fully aware that they possess inside them stale, stagnant water, and they're living a life of barrenness. Now, don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. In fact, I wanted to get a hat that says evangelist. Put my evangelist hat on. You know, the evangelist comes in, slices and dices and bleeds everybody, and then leaves. He gets to get out of town. And then the pastor comes and cleans up the mess. Are you reading between the lines of what I'm saying here? I hope you're hearing this today. So in our story here, the people finally got sick of playing a charade and they poured their hearts out to the man of God. That's called repentance and conversion. A lot of people get this repentance thing. They say, well, it just means to turn. Repent means to turn. No, it means to think differently. Peter said, except you repent and be converted, you shall all likewise perish. What's the difference there? Repent means to think differently. Convert means to turn and walk the other direction. This is what happened to them. They poured their hearts out to the man of God. And it's, to me, it's incredible the blessing that comes in our life when we're honest with ourselves and honest with God. 2 Kings 2.20, Elisha said... Bring me a new bowl with salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring that supplied the town with water and threw salt into it. And he said, this is what the Lord says, I have purified this water. It will no longer cause death or infertility. The water And the water has remained pure ever since, just as Elisha said. So then what's the purpose for salt? We see here it was for treating bitterness. It was for treating barrenness. It was for producing fruitfulness. And I think we can say salt is for restoration. And Jesus says that we are the salt of the earth. But I say it's more than that. I want to take a look. As we're clothed with him, he displays himself through us, revealing God's approval, which makes our sacrifices acceptable to God. I know I quoted Romans 12, but let's go to verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That word prove means to discern, test, and approve. So transformation is the salt that God's looking for in our life. Remember years ago, again, when Dad and I worked together, we used to take salt tablets. Alan, you ever take salt tablets? Yeah, you'd be out on the roof sweating like a hog. Take a break, take a couple salt tablets. It kept the salt in you. Look at Leviticus 2.13. And every oblation, that's special offering, of thy meat offering shall thou season with salt. 
Neither shall thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. And this, this thing here, covenant of thy God, the salt of the covenant of thy God, was kind of intriguing to me. So what do you do when you want to find an answer, but you don't know how to find the answer? Google it. Google it. In the men's Bible study, when George Cooper used to teach, he'd ask a question and nobody knew, and I said, Google it. Everybody Google it. Here's what I Googled. Are you ready? A covenant of perpetual obligation was called a covenant of salt. When people ate together, they commemorated their friendship with a covenant of salt. Salt was used as a form of payment when Roman soldiers were paid with it. Can you imagine that? Work all week and they give you a pound of salt. There you go. The modern word salary came from this practice of paying with salt. Actually, the salt of the covenant is God's eternal pledge of unfailing and unending love to the life of a believer. Can you say amen? So check out Ezekiel 43, 24. You are to present them, animal sacrifices, to the Lord, and the priests are to sprinkle salt on them and offer them as a burnt offering to the Lord. So it was the salt that was applied that made their offerings acceptable to God. Selah. Pause and think about that. So the New Testament, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot, under foot of men. Luke 14, 13 says, So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Brother Jerry, that's the rich man. You cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. We talked about that at the men's prayer breakfast yesterday morning. Those of you that missed that prayer breakfast, you missed a wonderful breakfast. Better than a wonderful breakfast. What's a better word than wonderful? Yeah, that's it. It was superb, and the word was incredible. And Brother Jerry mentioned about the rich young ruler that said, I've done all these things since my childhood. What's, what's the only thing that I lack? And Jesus said, you need to sell everything, give it to the poor. And he went away sad. But it reminded me of the fact that if God gave it to you once, he can give it to you again. And God wants to take what you've got as you give it and multiply it and increase it in your life. Woo! I just heard that in my spirit. Some of you need to let go of some of your money. And I'm not saying give it to me unless you want to. <laughs> some of you need to quit being tight and stingy. Is it all right to just speak like it is? Quit being, quit being selfish. If you see somebody in need... What's the word say? How is it you can say the love of God dwells in you when you have an abundance to give but you're stingy? That's Randy Hall version. I don't know why I'm saying that. Somebody needs to hear it. You need to let go of some stuff. Why? Because when you sow it, God will increase it and pour it back on top of you. You can't outgive God. You cannot outgive God. The only place in the Bible where he dares you to prove him is in Malachi 3. I don't know how it got there, but that's how we got there. Verse 34, salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. What's Jesus referring to? Are you ready? He's warning Christians about turning from the truth or living a compromised life because the lack of salt in your life can influence the other people you're with. Jesus said in John 15, 2, Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. See, in the Middle East, salt is, is at a premium because of its scarcity. And like all good things that God has made and Satan has counterfeited, there is a substitute salt. The salt 
The substitute salt is good to the taste, but if you try to preserve your food, especially it just in a matter of hours in the heat of the Middle East, it becomes inedible. That's why Jesus said that salt that has lost its flavor isn't even fit for the dunghill. More correctly put, unsavored salt leaves a stink behind it. So when our salt is from the works of our flesh, it will always produce a fruit that fails and is unproductive. Can I say that again? When our salt is from the works of our flesh, it'll be totally unproductive. Man can be successful for a season in the flesh. So the bottom line is this. We are given the life-giving salt from God as we walk in faith and total dependence in Him. And you might be a little bit surprised on who or what the salt is. Ephesians 1.12, God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, He identified you as His own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom He promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us the inheritance He promised and that He has purchased us to be His own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify Him. So who is the tree that's been given to us for man's bitterness? His name is Holy Spirit, but there's much more. He is the salt of God's covenant. He is the salt for barrenness. He is the resurrection life of Jesus, and He has imparted to us the salt by faith in the Lord Jesus. I love this. Jesus said in John 7, 38, are you all still with me? Okay. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. We can call this as having salt at its source. So I want to look up one more story quickly. Oh, you won't get out early today. Ezra 7, 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his request according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Now, how did this work? Ezra 7, verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach Israel statutes and judgments. Teach in Israel statutes and judgments. I don't know if you're seeing it. He said, I'm going to do everything I can do. So put your ears on now. I'm going to do everything I can do to seek God's will, including teaching others the ways of God. So can, I, can we say it this way? I'm going to use the salt that God has given to me for His purposes and not my own. So for these exact reasons, God used Ezra to rebuild, cleanse, and fill the temple with the worship of God. Let's go to Ezra 7.21. I, Artaxerxes the king, hereby send this decree to all the treasurers in the province west of the Euphrates River. You are to give Ezra, the priest and teacher of the law of the God of heaven, whatever he requests of you. You are to give him... You are to give him up to 7,500 pounds of silver. You know how much money that'd be today? 3,600,000. Give him 3,600,000, 500 bushels of wheat, 550 gallons of wine, 550 gallons of olive oil, and an unlimited supply of salt. Ezra expressed his needs, but he emphasized... I must have unlimited quantities of salt. In other words, I must never run out of salt because God will not accept anything that has not been seasoned with it. I hope you got your little clickers on and you put this all clicking in your head. What does that mean to us? He will accept nothing outside of the leading of the Holy Spirit. And everybody hands and said, that's true. That's true. Just think, through faith in Jesus Christ, God has given us unlimited quantities of salt. 
Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. He is El Shaddai, the God that's more than enough. So the questions are these. Do you need a refill of salt? Do you need a drink of fresh water today? Are you tired of coming up short? If so, do what Ezra did. Set your heart to seek the law and the Lord and do what he says. So today, today, will you let him heal you of stagnant, stale waters which cause you to be barren and unproductive? Will you let him give you all the salt that you can handle? Will you let him heal you from the delusion of thinking that you can please him through the works of your own hands and efforts? And will you let him deliver you from a carnal mindset which causes barrenness and brokenness? I want to close with this verse. 2 Kings 2.21 Then he went out to the spring that supplied the town with water and threw the salt into it and he said, This is what the Lord says. I have purified this water. It will no longer cause death and infertility. So here for the last quite some time, the Lord's been dealing with me to get more serious with him. I don't know if that applies to any of you. We can do better. I'm challenging you today. I'm challenging you to step up and let him complete you. I'm challenging you to look at your own heart. Don't worry about anybody else, you know, they're they're having problems, they're this, they're that, the other. Look at your own heart. Is your life unfruitful? Is your fruit casting itself to the ground prematurely? Are you bitter? You got something you're hanging on to that you need to let go? Are you carnal in your thinking? Do we need to make an adjustment? Can you do better? We all can. We all can. God's wanting us to take that piece of wood, shaped like a cross. Take that wood, let it make your bitter waters better. Better is better than bitter. That was hard to say. Is there anybody that would say, you know what? I've been kind of living a compromised life. Kind of been given in to the carnal thinking instead of thinking what God wants me to think. Pretty serious time. I set before you this day life or death, blessing or cursing. Only you can choose. I wish I could choose for you because I choose, oh yes, we want all the good, all the above. It's time, it's really, it's time to get serious with God. Read the headlines. Just read the headlines in the newspaper. Everything is shaping up. Well, I don't, can't believe that's happening. Oh, yeah, you can believe it. This is all part of God's plan. I think we're going to have some music up here. I'm going to ask you today, if this word has touched you in any way whatsoever, I'm going to ask you to come up here. And I know we don't usually do this. But I'm going to ask you to come up here and just kneel down by the steps up here and talk to God. Let's do what Ezra did. Thank you, Lord.